Good evening and welcome to SCH Academy's virtual campus for what is our 19th episode of SCH Connects, which are a series of conversations with um, about interesting topics with fascinating people, all of whom have some connection to our school. It really speaks to the breadth and depth of our community. An interesting note that our first Connects was about three years ago, um, almost three years ago now, and it was an info session on COVID-19. Kind of shows how we were trying to be creative and nimble during uh, an unknown time. I am Pete D. Donato, and I have the great privilege of being the Chief Innovation Officer at SCH and kicking off tonight's conversation. Uh, before I introduce our moderator, I did want to say a word about SCH's leadership over the past decade plus. I think we always knew that technology for tech's sake was not a good solution, that we needed a combination of technology, creative thinking, the humanities, ethics, a growth mindset, all together to kind of figure things out. And never before does this seem more appropriate than when we're talking about AI and the future of education and really the future of everything else. If you believe the hype that's going on right now. Um, it also gives me great confidence to know that our board of trustees is thinking at the 30,000 foot level about the future and brings their expertise to many of these conversations. Our moderator tonight, Young Moo Kim, is a member of our board. He's also a parent, a proud community member, and a mentor to our robotics team, as you just heard a few minutes ago. So, with that being said, I'd like to turn it over to Young Mu and thank him and thank all of our panelists. And I will see you when we're ready to wrap up in about an hour. Young Mu. Thanks so much, Pete. And again, we're just such huge fans of your work and of the school. So it's just a wonderful opportunity to be with you tonight. You. Um, so I am Young Mu Kim, a uh, parent and trustee uh, and and sometimes robotics coach. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm you know, my son has been part of the SH community since pre-K and now he's class of 2026. And, you know, so hopefully a few more years. But um, during, uh, in my day job, I'm a professor at Drexel University of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, and I direct a research institute called the Excite Center, which is about the intersection of technology and creative expression. So how I wound up in the job that I have today, and this is something I'm gonna ask of everyone, by the way, I mean, how I wound up here is I actually came through two pathways. I studied both music and engineering through school, through college and graduate school, and then found an intersection around media technologies. So in coming to Drexel, I started a lab around music and entertainment technologies and had already studied a great deal about AI and its use for uh, understanding sound, video and uh, images. So I brought that background and has carried forward into my research. But what's really struck me is about the connections between that kind of research and the broader implications on not just uh, learning and education, but on broader society as well. And I'm sure that's something we're going to dive into in some detail in just a second. So let's go around the room and uh, meet our panelists. Uh, we're going to ask you, of course, what's your connection to SCH and what do you do during the day and how you wound up there? So um, just going around on my screen, uh, Amit, can we start with you? Sure, sure. Uh, Amit Gandhi and a parent of three wonderful and sometimes well-behaved children at SCH, uh, uh, second grade, uh, second grade, Aryan Karina and Christian, who's in the seventh grade. Um, I am uh, currently a vice president and technical fellow at Airbnb, where I help lead the data science and economics functions. Um, I also work with the uh, AI for Business program at, at Wharton, um, teaching uh, marketing and economics. Um, formerly chief economist at uh, Microsoft Cloud. And um, yeah, I guess I'm here because I have an unnatural, uh, unhealthy obsession for all things data economics and uh, technology. So uh, thrilled thrilled to be here uh, and thanks for organizing um, everyone. Thanks, Amit. Great to have you here on the panel. Uh, next up on my screen is Sarah. Sarah, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Sarah McDowell. I am a history teacher uh, here at SCH and also the history department chair. Um, I've been here about 16 years now, um, and um, I teach 10th grade and 11th grade history right now. Um, and how I ended up on this panel is that 
Um, as a school, as a history teacher, as a chair, we have to keep up with all the emerging technology. And this is a big deal. Um, this will uh, in some ways alter um, what we do. Uh, and so I've been, I had already been thinking about it and reading about it and playing around with it uh, with the chat GPT-3 um, and, uh, and was really happy to, um, to be on this panel and think about how we use this tool as a school. Thanks, Sarah. Great to have you here. We, of course, we love all of our SCH teachers and know how much time, effort, and commitment you put, you know, towards the enterprise of educating our children. So thank you for taking a little extra time tonight to join us on this panel. All right. Last but definitely not least, I mean, we, hang, we, we hung together all weekend at the robotics competition, but Paul, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm Paul Boringer, class of 2015 or 2015. Um, and basically I'm pretty new into the AI area. I, um, I got into programming in my undergrad, uh, ironically, whole other SCH top, uh, connects topic, uh, but I got in studying bank contagion, uh, you know, like doing kind of math on that stochastic stuff, um, led me to a graduate program, uh, focused in statistics, um, computer science and AI. So mm -hmm. from there, just continued on um on somewhat of a more blockchain inspired path but uh always interested in the machine learning side of things um and ended up at a company that really values the two things um we basically uh develop smart contracts and also uh do proprietary trading using artificial intelligence uh we just a couple days ago not myself but uh someone on my team uh, implement at chat GPT 3.5 in a live production system that's going out to hedge funds. So um, it's definitely relevant to what we're doing for work. Super cool. Awesome. Well, thank you, Paul. Thanks for joining us. And of course, it's always great to welcome alums back to the school and to our events. So, um, all right, let's just dive in. We're going to chat for, you know, 30, 40 minutes or so. And of course, we'll try to leave a lot of time at the end for uh, questions as well. Um, Wanted to start off with, uh, you know, to try to get some uh, folks who may not be following as closely as we are, you know, up to speed. Um, you know, I think a lot of people do feel overwhelmed by all of this news, all of these different systems, right? There seems every day there's some, you know, new big announcement around AI. And, um, you know, maybe just providing a, 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 as brief as we can, I mean, this is a deep topic, it's hard to do quickly, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, as brief as we can, sort of an overview of the landscape of AI. So Ahmed, I want to start with you because you've been working in this industry for quite some time, right? Yeah. And it's been most of your career. So maybe can you start us off about kind of that big picture view? I'll try to tee us off and looking forward to uh, some of the other panelists thoughts on this. But um, yeah, I mean, if you feel overwhelmed, quite honestly, welcome to the club. I think um, the news in the space is going so quick. I mean, your head should be spinning um, and mine certainly is. But if we had to like step back a bit and kind of take that 90,000 foot view, um, I think one way to think about what's happening is sort of through the lens of an of an industrial revolution of sorts. Um, you know, think about the steam engine, electricity, the internet, you know, things on that order of magnitude and importance. So if you think about like all those industrial shifts of the past, one thing they all had in common is that a new technology came along and it automated an activity that humans were doing manually, right? And so um, one thing about this AI revolution, if I'm gonna call it that for a second, is that it's, and what makes it frightening and, and interesting is that it's automating an activity that I think we humans hold near and dear to our hearts, which is the ability to create, you know, the ability to, 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 to write, to express, to, to visualize. Um, and it's happening at an astonishingly fast rate. I think, you know, things that felt like they would evolve over the course of, of decades seem to be happening over the time span of months. Um, and part of the reason I've been thinking a lot about this, like what, what what's, what's going on here? Why is this so fast? Um, the ingredients, and this is sort of thinking about the landscape a little bit, uh, that sort of go into what we're seeing are actually pretty simple. Um, there's sort of three things at work, and I'm just going to, if there's one thing to take away from my little spiel here, it's just these three things. There are, there is 
compute, there is algorithms, and there is data. Th those are the three things that go into this little pot. And I'll just kind of drill into each one for a second. With compute, you know, there are a set of these mathematical models, these large language models. They have the names, GPT that you've heard about, Lambda. You may have heard about that from Google. They're getting released to the world by a handful of pretty large institutions. We're talking about Microsoft, Google, maybe a few governments around the world. And they're getting built in these industrial complexes, which are these supercomputers that are in undisclosed locations in the Midwest that have racks of servers as far as the eye can see. So this is incredible computational resource and expense. And I think I heard that the cost of building GPT-4 was somewhere in the upwards of $20 billion. So this is incredible like computational power that we're suddenly throwing at, at AI. The second part is algorithms. And that's sort of where ChatGPT shows up, right? So ChatGPT, I would sort of think about as the first killer app that uses all the processing power of these large language models. Um, think about the Intel processor in your laptop. That's a powerful processor, but it's not really interesting unless it has Microsoft Windows or Microsoft Words or some, some application that you can use. And ChatGPT is, is that application. It's our first killer app, and it, it involves all kinds of algorithmic ingenuity. And, and I'm sure, Paul, you're going to have some great, interesting thoughts to, to share on that ingenuity. What I'll just say is that it's the first app, and we should expect many more apps to come. Think about the iPhone when it first came out. We had iTunes, and then we had a whole app store. So many more interesting apps to come. Um, and then the third part, and I'll just kind of conclude there, is, is the data. And I think this is where it gets kind of interesting, because when you interact with chat GPT, all of us feel something magical, like something amazing is happening. I am beholding machine intelligence, you know, this, this is kind of this, this, this feeling that you have. And the irony of that feeling is that there's nothing in the technology or the math or the models that that's trying to mimic human intelligence in any meaningful way. At the end of the day, chat GPT and GPT are a form of statistical prediction on text. So just to give you an example, when I say twinkle, twinkle, <laughs> Most of you are going to expect that the next words that come out are a little star, right? So twinkle, twinkle, little star. Um, we can teach computers to make that same prediction. If I give them enough data that has twinkle, twinkle, followed by a little star, it will form that association. And that's it. That's really all that's going on at the end of the day. Now, your email has autocomplete that uses the, exactly the same technology. It just so happens when you use that kind of approach with 20 trillion parameters in a $20 billion data center, what comes out the other end is incredible prose, incredible sort of wisdom and knowledge. But the chat GPT and the GPT, they don't under, it doesn't understand the words itself. It doesn't know the ideas and it doesn't know the meaning and the connections between ideas. And I think that's really kind of the philosophical conundrum. I think it's really fascinating. Is that AI or not? And that's certainly, a debate that's been happening. But I think what's undeniable is that it's powerful and it has the ability to automate creative work in a way that I don't think we've ever seen. Thanks, Amit. I think that was a fantastic summary uh, of that landscape. But I want to pull on one of the threads that you introduced, which is sort of that historical lens, right? There's this, you know, obviously there's a the potential for enormous disruption, like an industrial revolution or a new technology that for automation that really changes human lives. Right, um, may, potentially for good, but also potentially for ill. So I want to bring in our historian <laughs> uh, to reflect on that. And again, I mean, I mean, I know we didn't really prep for this, so I'm kind of going to throw you a curveball, Sarah. I hope that's okay. But uh, you know, if you care to comment on the sort of a history from a historical lens and place that in some context, do you think that this is potentially as disruptive as you know uh, uh, the the steam engine or uh, other other forms of technological disruption? So I'll answer that by saying I don't know enough about chat GPT and AI to, to know its power, but what I've read and what, um, what I've been hearing from people who do know is that it has the potential to be um, somebody that I uh, was reading said is the potential to be as disruptive as a um, discovery of fire. So 
Um, I think that might be a little bit hyperbolic, but um, it will be disruptive for sure. Um, I think that there will be, um, just like every other technological disruption, there will be um, probably um, uh, some displacement um, in the workplace, but then replacement with other jobs. So there's going to have to be a lot of shifting. Um, and I think that I, the part I think that will be hard is that in the industrial revolution, it was a slower change. Um, the change happened much more slowly and there was more time to adjust. This seems to be extremely fast um, because of the nature, because it's helping itself improve, if I understand correctly. Um, and so um, the, 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 the speed of the change might be a little bit more disruptive than, say, the steam engine was. Yeah. Well, so much uh, economic investment is going into the development of AI. I mean, on it, you mentioned $20 billion potentially for GPT-4, and that was just from OpenAI and its investors. And when you add the investments of Google, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook in this arena, right? The I mean, when you add the market caps of those top five companies, you get something bigger than the GDP of most countries. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> that's the level of investment that's going into this. So it's in accelerating and 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 obviously it's incredibly powerful. Um, uh, I guess one thing I've also heard, I mean, just in terms of, you know, when we look at history and we, we think, oh, industrial revolution. Yeah. I mean, steam engine and that automated so many things. We don't think about the, you know, the actual human lives that were affected as much and that, you know, a lot of people were displaced, uh, were put out of work, had to change careers. Um and and when it's happening in real time, you know, in front of us, that's obviously we're going to feel that a little more. Uh, but what I'd like to do is actually sort of um, demystify some of this, right? I mean, rather than it being the big black box and and the unknown, um, d as much as we can. Again, I, I understand this is primarily a non-technical audience. This is not, you know, an IEEE research conference or anything like that. Uh, but Paul, do you want to um, try to describe, you know, just Basically, what you know? How does ChatGPT work? You know, what goes into it? How is it created? And um, you know, from you know your studies, uh, how are you yeah, applying um, it? No, and I, I think Amit kind of uh, Amit got to the point of um, the the first point that should be focused on is it is a probability model where you know you have this this series of words, you know, twinkle twinkle little star, and then our uh, little star, and how I wonder what you are. That is so. It, you're just predicting what comes next. Um, but the the thing about it is uh, there there is a little bit more to it than that because uh, one of the big or well, I shouldn't say there isn't there there isn't more to it than that, but the algorithms that have gone behind it um, to help it progress, that that's really where the ingenuity comes in. So I think uh, attention is all you need. What was that a 2019 paper? Um, so that was that was um, basically this new concept in neural nets called attention, where you 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 look at what's happening and what's important and um, and the the series of words, and it'll let you go back and see you know if I ask uh, you know I, if I give you a long paragraph and I ask you know who was the second person mentioned you could go back and read that, but chat GPT isn't really a calculator. Uh, it doesn't exactly know like who is, you know, this is person one, this is person two. It, it seems like it does because it's a probabilistic model, but really it's just read plenty of examples of someone being asked that question, uh, you know, who's first, who's second, who's third. And it reads that out. So um, really it's just when you, when you have um, this regression model, for lack of a better word, it's not not linear regression, but no, don't need to go into that. Um, you eventually, if you make it big enough, you can just represent uh, basically what what seems like talking to a human, where you know it 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 will read all these words and uh, output the next um, output the next word. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to uh, kind of uh, jump add on to that because. So right now, Chad GPT-3, uh, when this talk was planned in 3.5, uh, it was kind of just a language model. Now, um, there a couple of days ago was something called Chad GPT-4 that came out. And 
Uh, admittedly, OpenAI, um, not as open as was once planned. Uh, their their um, new research paper on ChatGPT4, really, it's not as much of a paper because they uh, don't disclose kind of their innovative algorithms but and how it works, but more the capabilities of them. Uh, but there, there is hints that uh, chat GPT-4 has some basis, some more basis in fact, and uh, the ability to check in on itself. So now, you know, if you say two plus two equals four, not only is it going off of, oh, well, I just see two plus two equals and then four always follows it, but it, it actually has the ability to check in on itself and say, this is the meaning I'm, I'm trying to add two numbers and what are what is it literally equal to not what is the most likely answer and uh i think that development um and i'd love to go back to that later if either of you have heard of um the introduction of not only word embeddings but entity vectors um or are you yeah so uh, we, we should talk on that later but um uh, I don't want to hold up. Is that new to GPT? Is that new to GPT four, or that was being used before? I have a suspicion it was being. It was not in GPT three. Uh, I can basically mm -hmm. confirm that. But um, I have a suspicion it's being used in GPT four, and all those are is um, you know, you have the word the eagles, and um, when you have been trained on all the text in history, you know, and you have this large neural net, it's likely that um just due to the attention mechanism in chat gpt it'll know you're talking about a football team but now uh with entity vectors they break apart they also break apart sentences and you represent words as one thing and then the eagles would likely be picked up as an entity and then maybe like all like the eagles won the game um the only entities in there would be eagles and game and then you know there's that action verb one so it it will help the it'll help any model add context so i think as we um start giving these models the ability to ground themselves in fact and actually check themselves instead of think they're right well, we'll see much more powerful things come out of it yeah yeah well I mean, obviously it's changing so quickly but i think it's very important what, what you just said i mean the way these systems learn is not that we give it like the rules of language or grammar it's not like subject verb object Right. No, I mean, we feed it tons and tons of data, as I mean, alluded to earlier. I mean, basically almost all the text that's on the Internet. Right. That's its training set. I mean, for good or ill, by the way, and we can talk about some of the implications of that. But, you know, it's able to read so much, you know, millions and millions of pages. And from that, infer these patterns. Right. And it uses, again, um, as Paul mentioned, this, this uh, technology called deep neural networks. Right. And uh, which are, you know, large, large computer programs. And we need to throw tons of compute power at it. Uh, and then applying, you know, kind of innovative algorithms from the last few years, this idea of transfer. I mean, GPT stands for uh, what? Generative Predictive Transformer. Right. I think that's generative oh. pre-trained pre-trained transformer. Thank you. Thank you. Generative pre-trained transformer. Yeah. And I, I guess the one way I explain it to my students is that before transformers, you can have all the all the web pages, right? And just jumble them up, right? And you wouldn't necessarily know. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, but you know, it's all these sentences, all these things that can happen kind of without much context. But with transformers, what it allows you to do is to sort of connect concepts over pages or over a document like that, that, that um, so that when you are referring to he, then it has a much better understanding that he refers to Bob, who was referenced earlier in the paragraph. And Youngwood, right. just to say one thing on that, and connecting Please. what yeah. Sarah said, um, just at the pace of this change, I mean, the transformer, the seminal paper on transformer models came out in 2017. I mean, this is like, <laughs> this is <clears throat> just light speed. I mean, we're going yeah. from, 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 a, from an idea to like, you know, industrial revolution in, in, in five years. And so um, I, I think it's, it's, it's pretty, um, it's pretty remarkable. It really is. Yeah. And then what you alluded to earlier, I mean, it being overwhelmed, we're all I mean, AI researchers are overwhelmed, mm -hmm. right? It's impossible to keep up with all the advances that are happening. I mean, you think you can wait for the next issue of the journal? No, you'll be out of date. <laughs> that time. You have to be, you know, reading every single thing that comes out. And it's impossible. All right, let's change, but let's then maybe change our focus a little bit away from the technology itself and more of the, the implications and applications. Um, 
you know, we're all, well, we're all affiliated with this, this school, this wonderful school, and many of us are affiliated with other education organizations as well. So in my role at Drexel, I am on a university committee studying, you know, the implications of AI and trying to issue guidance to all of our faculty, right? Uh, and I I made this joke uh, recently that, you know, we can't be very strict about this. If we issue rules, they will look silly within a week or mm -hmm. a couple of weeks, right? Because the technology advances so quickly. So um, let's see, Sarah, I'm gonna turn to you again. I mean, in, in the sort of teaching and learning context, um, I mean, I'm guessing you've already used ChatGPT. Have you encountered it? in student work and have you have you had to deal with well how do we use this how do we not use it yeah so um i have used it um with my 14 year old nephew so that was a lot of fun um and i've used it in other contexts too but um so for schools i think the most important thing is we have to can we have to deal with it um it would be nice if we could just duck our heads and pretend it didn't exist that would make our lives easier but it is the cat's out of the bag and it's um it it's here and so what we are doing is looking at it um, and trying to figure out, I think there's kind of two parts of it. You have to figure out how you can actually use it in a beneficial way, because there are a lot of really great things kids can do with, um, especially older kids can do with this technology. Um, and then you have to figure out how to, um, ChatGPT3 was pretty easy to spot writing by it. It was um uh, pretty predictable writing patterns. I haven't tried for yet. It might be a stronger writer. Um, we have had work, you know, submitted that was definitely um, uh, chat GPT uh, created work, but, you know, um, and the, the tools we have to catch. So, you know, plagiarism or taking things from other sources don't work on it, right? Because it generates something new every time you ask it the same question, you can alter it, tell it to change its language, all that other stuff. So, um, we have to figure out, um, you know, when when all these other technological innovations happened in schools with, um, you know, the Internet and Googling and all that, you know, cut and paste and all that other stuff, we figured out how to help kids not use that as a crutch and still be able to be um, to learn the skills they need and to um, to be critical thinkers. And that's, I think, the road we have to go down is figure out how to make sure that they are um, continuing to build the skills they need as human beings um, without relying or um, using the AI as a crutch. Um, so there's a lot of different things we can do, and we're talking about a lot of possibilities. Um, even blocking it isn't helpful because the kids know how to get around those blocks pretty easily. So that's a little bit of a Band-Aid on a, I mean, it's, you know, it's not a bad idea, but um, they're smart. <laughs> I Yes. Yeah. Well, as any parent knows, your kids will find ways around things. Like they you know, if they really want something, they will find their ways around it. Uh, but there are, of course, many, many positive uses in mm -hmm. education. I mean, I mean, one thing that we've done is encourage people, you know, if, if it's, you know, to, to have a question, start it in chat GPT, right? Mm -hmm. Get that response to get over the sort of the blank page problem and then refine that, right? But show your work, of course, along along the way. Yeah, I think for higher for you know kids in high school and beyond, um, that's great. It's the it's those kids who are in that intermediate stage who haven't built their own skills yet. Sure. Um, I think those are where we're going to go. Maybe more back to paper or um, making sure that they know how to do it themselves. Then they get that tutoring aid from the Chat GPT because it's great. I mean, it is really helpful in a first draft. Absolutely. Um, Amit, have you used it in like an education context or do you have other ideas about sort of positive uses for, for AI technology? Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I haven't woven it into the classroom experience as such, but I have seen some Wharton colleagues um, who have thoroughly embraced it. So required chat GPT mm -hmm. as part of the course. And I think one interesting learning um, that came out of it for me, and this is a Ethan Ethan Malik uh, at uh, at Warden, is that um, it's not necessarily easy to prompt ChatGPT to write a great essay. So I think he actually challenged some students to uh, to 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 you know put your finest work forward with ChatGPT. And I think ultimately, and I think Sarah, this you're sort of getting at this a little bit. Um, there is a model here where, yeah, I mean ChatGPT kind of seeds some some initial language, but. Mm -hmm. You have to refine it and you have to co-edit and 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 we're kind of 
you know, putting our writers maybe more in the in the in the mindset of, of really an editor, and and you you have to sort of give ChatGPT maybe not just open ended instructions, but some constraints, and and then you give it some feedback. And so I I think, I mean, cognitively, there's still a lot going on there mm -hmm. to produce really high quality work. And I I think in some ways that's the positive. I mean, you 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 really start to appreciate your writing from the vantage point of, of like an editor versus um, uh, just raw language. Um, I think the personalization of education, I, I think is, is, is huge. I think, you know, we can, you know, create these tutoring moments as the work is happening. Because I think there's been a lot of research to show that, you know, tutoring, when it happens outside of the class, you know, as, as a bolt on is not nearly as effective as in the in the moment of sort of the activity or the or the skill. Um, Khan Academy has a really interesting uh, chatbot they've released uh, to to uh, to complement some of their uh, instructions. I think that he calls it Conmigo, so that's the chatbot's name. Um, and it's very intentional about not giving you the answer, kind of like really mm -hmm. think through the steps. And and I think that that's useful. But look, the plagiarism part, Sarah and and Young move for me. I mean, I don't know how you get around that one. I mean, that seems weird and complicated and I, I don't know what, how one even thinks about that well a lot of times it's not about fighting technology with technology right mm -hmm. it's the sort of social adaptation right so you know in art some of our discussions it's been well we have an academic honesty policy right you can't pass off someone or some things work mm -hmm. as your own right and we have to hold our students to that standard of course there need to be guardrails there need to be checks around that and yeah with chat gpt currently the guardrails really aren't there there are, just as an aside for our audience, I mean, of course, there are tools that claim to be able to detect the use of ChatGPT, which, and they're, they actually are pretty good. They're pretty good, but they're not 100%, right? No, no, nothing's foolproof. And so what we're really encouraging is try to find ways and to explore ways to get students to use it, to use it for a positive, uh, for positive benefits. Right. right. So, Paul, I want to turn to you. I mean, you've deployed something or your, your company has deployed, you know, in this sense, um, what are some of the ways it's being used, uh, you know, uh, in your business or in your work that, that are having, that have potentially a really positive effect, positive outcomes? So it really is, uh, uh, it's a data reducer for us and for our clients. Um, uh, basically Twitter, I mean, everyone, everyone knows social media. There's uh, a lot of data out there. Um, basically the current use as much as i can say is uh it, let's say a hedge fund is concerned about bank of america or um any other you know service provider i know nothing about bank of america i'm just picking a bank actually specifically because they're not one we look at but um and then we'll go on Twitter and scrape every single tweet having to do with them. And that is, you know, if something is happening, trending on Twitter, that can be millions. And we'll literally tell chat GPT uh, in, in batches in kind of an educated way, can you summarize this? And then we'll say, can you summarize a summary? Can you summarize a summary until you have, uh, you know, a million tweets uh, summarized into a paragraph. And then if you want to, you know, give it kind of any prompt, that's, it's the same framework. So you can really figure out um, how we as a um, metaverse, if we're going to go in that direction, which uh, feel about a certain topic. So it's, uh, and it's really powerful. I mean, it's pretty mm -hmm. remarkable. Uh, some things aren't so good, you know, you can, you can trick it, but summaries, I think, uh, I think ChatGPT Chat GPT has that uh, to a point uh, at the ChatGPT3 level. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's amazing to try to like sort of get your finger on the pulse of the internet, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's potentially what's possible. I mean, when you're, you're scraping Twitter and all things like that. I mean, just as a total aside, I've done a lot of work in the music space, right? Where people try to use these technologies and tools to uh, predict the success of a song or at least find songs that people might be really, really interested in, right? Mm -hmm. And there's very little in the music itself that leads to that prediction. It's usually the external, the cultural factors. What else is happening? What mm -hmm. else have you listened to, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, you seem to like, you know, these these angsty artists, but now we need to know what, you know, how to quantify angstiness, right? And that's from what other people have written about those artists. So it's yeah. a lot of external factors like that. 
Um, okay, before we open it up for questions, and I'm sure there can be many, by the way, I mean, so people in the audience, feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A tab there. Uh, we'd love to hear from all of you, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, but before we do that, okay, let's do the fun part, which is going to be now to explore some of the dark side. <laughs> Okay, because everybody everybody asks is uh, just a little bit of context. I've done some robotics work, and everybody everybody asks, so when are the robots going to rise up and take over, right? Mm -hmm. And my joke used to be, hey, come to my lab, watch our robots, and you can see that they take take about two steps before they fall over, right? <laughs> and you will be assuaged of your fears. The robot uprising is not happening anytime soon. And yet, yeah, AI, I mean, ChatGPT and other systems. I mean, we haven't even talked about like the image generating systems like Dolly, Stable Diffusion, or even music generation systems like Google's Music LM, which is really compelling, um, you know, are starting to mimic really human creative artistic behavior, right? So I'm gonna ask each of you to sort of say, well, what's the scariest thing you've seen generated by AI or associated with AI so far? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll just say, like, I mean, just fake content. I mean, I think, I think, kind of this notion of, uh, of, 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 you know, if we were concerned about fake news uh, five years ago, I mean, that was human-generated fake news, let alone uh, Chat GPT-generated fake news. And so, I, you know, I, I do think there are some serious geopolitical risks with just content and deception. I mean, there's a basic law of economics: when the price of something falls, um, we consume more of it, and you know, the price of deception has fallen here and uh, we should expect to see more of it. And 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 so I, I, I have like genuine worries about that side of this equation. And I'm hopeful, like, I think we need regulation. I mean, we're going to need legal frameworks to step up here that we were a little slow with the internet. Um, and I think things are just going to have to work um, a lot faster. Um, I think I um, agree with what you're saying about misinformation um, being pretty scary, but I think what's really scary is even with guardrails on chat GPT, it doesn't seem to understand the difference between what's real and what's not. It's generated false content with the best of, in I guess it can't have intentions, but within its guardrails, um, it's generated false content because it doesn't know the difference between truth and not, not true and not true. Um, and so while we while I know ChatGPT3 anyway had some strong guardrails built in after a few pretty crazy situations, um, uh, they um, they it doesn't know what truth is. So um, and since it has access to everything on the internet, it may um, generate things that are are untrue. Um, and the thing that that worries me, and I haven't seen this yet, is that. For me, it's it's in social media with kids. If it does get put in social media programs and is interacting with kids, most of them are going to lack the ability to tell real from the bot from the person. And I feel that that uh, social media has already had um, some pretty negative implications for a lot of young people. Um, and I really worry that if it starts to be put into social media for um, it, it'll really influence kids in ways that I mean, maybe it'll be really great. Maybe it'll teach me to have self-confidence, but um, yeah. I worry about that application. Sure. Well, that's actually, that's really interesting, uh, Sarah, because I I never thought about it being used in, in that context. So I like that your your head went there. The The thing I will say is um, I'm really concerned about people in the short term being able to use it, uh, you know, to fulfill their agendas, like potentially, you know, TikTok, um, you know, potentially, or any, you know, any social media uh, company having an agenda. However, I think in the long term, I, I'm really hopeful because as these neural networks grow and algorithms become more advanced, uh, people with bad intentions, I think uh, I have a strong feeling that because these models are trained on everything, that, you know, the the archetypes of what is good and what is bad are built so deeply into all that text that, you're really not going to be able to trick it of what is good and what is bad. So I think as long as in the long run, the um, the objective function or the loss, on, the loss is uh, aimed to minimize uh, bad things and optimize good things, then mm -hmm. um, I don't think that people's uh, negative agenda, would, any, you know, any individual's negative agenda would be able to overpower, um, you know, um, 
a true singularity where the where um, these neural nets become more connected and more powerful than uh, any individual brain. I hope you're right. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I, I guess I take, uh, again, we've mentioned history a couple of times, I try to take a long term view on this, right? AI, the history of AI has been one of like fits and starts, and then long periods of, of sort of gestation, right? Um, AI researchers famously talk about the AI winter, which yes. was, you know, there's all this hype in the 70s, or, you know, 60s, 70s around AI, hey, we're gonna have talking computers by 1980. We're going to have, you know, the, the vision of Hal in 2001, the movie, right? That book was written in the 1960s, right? Um, and of course, so then there's this long period of, you know, uh, again, we couldn't even say the words AI. We couldn't put that in grant applications because they said, oh, no, no, that's dead. Or that's the AI winter. We had to come up with a new term, machine learning, to uh, to solicit more funding from uh, government agencies and, and whatnot. So, you know, I uh, the, the the notion that AI, I mean, we're, we're obviously I'm not denying we've had incredible advances in recent years, but to say that it's just going to be a straight path forward, right, or a straight path up, I think is is you know it's possible, but but not necessarily a given, yeah. right? Uh, and that the the notion, I mean, Paul, just want to define what the singularity is in case people out there don't know. The singularity is this condition, right? Like Ray Kurzweil and others came up with this terminology when the AI learns so fast that its learning rate is infinite. Right, that the basically we've lost control of the AI. It's feeding itself and learning so fast that it becomes super intelligent without us even knowing it. And then the fear is that that happens so quickly that no one can pull the plug. Mm -hmm. Right, that's the that's the sort of sci-fi. Yet yeah, not not so sci-fi. I mean, there there are reasonable people who actually fear this outcome. So uh, I'll tell you my fear, though my my fear for the short term, right, is um, one of bias. Right, and we've seen this played out in so many situations. The AI is only as good as the data. That it's fed, right? And when the data it's fed is largely biased, and you know, let's face it, a lot of the internet, uh, the data on the internet, right? Data that we scrape for these systems is biased, right? In some way or another. I mean, Amazon famously, you know, had an AI trained HR system that basically learned to filter out women, right? Because they said, oh, the most successful candidates that you know were, were the male candidates, so it learned that. We've seen terrible systems that that basically learn racial discrimination. Right uh, from images and from um, you know other you know situations, camera camera based systems. So that's my biggest fear uh, around that. All right, we have some questions streaming in. So let's uh, let's let's go to this. So um, all right, this is a really great one. Um, let's start with this. What do you think is the plausibility of the U.S. and China cooperating to slow down further AI progress on both sides of the Pacific? Let's see, Amit, you work for a multinational business. <laughs> So I'm going to throw this one at you to begin with. Well, you know, as, as a representative of, uh, of America, <laughs> I think, um, well, I think the analogy is a, one analogy to draw from the question that I think is worth sort of keeping in the back of your minds is this is a little bit like nuclear weapons. I mean, if you think about the last time, what, what did major, you know, governments have to coordinate its development of, of something technological was, was sort of nuclear arms race. And there is an arms race quality to this. So, I mean, companies are in an arms race and countries are in an arms race. Um, I think the challenge with the, the the sort of cooperation in its current state is that I don't think a lot of people have visibility into what China is building in this space. I think, you know, the, the Chinese government um, itself, you know, that has, has a, they, I don't think they're reliant as much on, on their corporations. They, they can take on um, the project themselves. And so I think, there's a lot of shroudedness and secrecy. Um, so I'm not hopeful for that in the short term, but I do think the US can set an example for sure and sort of get, you know, guardrails and governance. And, and I think everything, Paul, you were saying also kind of relies a little bit on the nobility of OpenAI CEO, like, you know, Sam Altman and Satya, please, you know, be noble. But I think, um, I, th I think, you know, the US taking a lead, um, is 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 a worthwhile kind of opening position. I just want to say and, hi to Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's also uh, playing out in interesting ways. I mean, of course, there's the core AI technology, but then you also see um, the geopolitics around chip development, mm -hmm. right? And so much, I mean, and so much of our, our 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 country's fabrication technology is actually based in Taiwan, right? Which is, of course, you know, you know, a geopolitical somewhat hot zone. 
So, um, you know, that's why there's so much movement to move um, some chip production back to, you know, the United States, but to, to, to distribute that. Um, and then I would also point to, and I'd love to, if anyone has more comments on this, right, that no one, no one has that monopoly of um, algorithms or uh, or data, really. I mean, I mean, but sorry, there, the, some companies have huge amounts of data, but I mean, whether it's the U.S. or China, right? There's just enormous amount of data that citizens seemingly have willingly given up in the most cases, right? Because we like social media, because we like taking photos, because we like writing things, right? So I don't. I mean, so I like the analogy that it's a you know a bit of an arms race, but it's not one where the technology is as super exclusive or you know the the nuclear secrets are quite as guarded as they were you know in the 50s 60s and 70s and so on the, spell, the, secret, the secret sauce is not not as secret yeah a, a funny note on that facebook has a model about half the size of chat gpt4 and a disgruntled employee uh wasn't supposed to be public uh and a disgruntled employee released it on BitTorrent uh about a week ago yeah. if you have 250 gigabytes to spare um you can go download it. And, you know, maybe, you know, as taking uh, Sarah's con law class, I shouldn't say this, but, you know, I, I encourage developers personally, you know, if you can take those actions anonymously, um, you know, having those uh, networks that you, you know, that you that are public, I think is a good thing. Um, and uh, one thing on open AI, um, because I made a joke about being not so open, you know, it, it, it received a hundred million dollar donation uh, with the intent of remaining an open source software company. So, I mean, we, you know, as long as uh, I, I think there's a lot of people who a lot of the software developers do care about decentralization and do care about um, making it um, accessible to everyone. And I think maybe some corporate leaders don't want that for their competitive edge, but um, I don't think they'll be able to, overpower the the people actually writing the code that's just my personal take there yeah yeah i mean open ai is, is great branding right <laughs> it just opens in the name but unfortunately most of their systems are not open at this point and mm -hmm. even despite a hundred million dollar initial investment right that can easily be dwarfed and has been dwarfed right by the billions of dollars oh. of investment that you know that microsoft and others have put into open ai um okay here's here's a question on a topic we haven't talked about but of course touches ai uh, the question is, as a science writer editor, if mm -hmm. my copywritten material has been used to train ChatGPT, how is that within legal parameters? So we haven't talked about copyright at all. And of course, this is a huge legal quagmire. But um, mm -hmm. anyone want to venture uh, uh, an initial answer? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll take this one because it uh, reminds me of a someone in, in uh, the cryptography world that I think is a leader in the space. And he has a great... Uh, phrase for kind of this exact question which is that you know anyone who thinks that their writing is their own is significantly overestimating their own contribution so i understand we're not going along with copyright law but we mm -hmm. all stand on the shoulder the, uh, the shoulders of giants people have you know we're all informed from all the discoveries of everyone before us so you know if you add that little bit you know just recognize that chat gpt was also trained on everything you learned you learned from before it and you know they're they're going to take your little contribution and then they're going to take all the contributions of people who build on top of that so while it, you know it doesn't answer the copyright question if your material is on the internet um it's what's the difference if i learn from it and uh you know go and build on top of that which people do so you know i don't think it's a succinct answer but uh you know well, i think it's another way of saying that i mean i I was actually diving into this topic recently. I was reading a paper that tries to technologically solve for this, but I believe the answer is in in current state, no. I mean, I'm kind of your your mm -hmm. your you know copyrighted or intellectual property. It, it could be in the training data, and, and and so it could be reflected in ChatGPT's personality in some way, um, in ways that that I don't believe you, you are currently protected. Although I I mean I and I agree with what um, Paul was saying in the sense that I think. The, the data is so immense that it's, it's pretty hard to, I think, attribute back to any one author. But when you get into situations like, you know, show this content in the style of some author, you know, th then it starts to get a little bit more personal. I, I do kind of, it, it maybe, you know, there, there's there's a legal question here that I'm not the lawyer to, to answer, but, um, but it, it's a murky legal topic. I know that at a minimum. 
Yeah, and, and it's one that's touching not just writing, but of course now visual arts and even music. Um, I know that, well, one, I would highly recommend, um, there's a great series, um, an old YouTube series that's been refreshed called Everything is a Remix. And mm. it's by Kirby Ferguson, who's this amazing filmmaker, but who really distills down how culture, right? How these creative acts that we do are really most of the time remixes of things that came before, right? Yeah. So if we're allowing ourselves as individual humans to do that, to, of course, we read stuff. We see art, we see, we, ex, you know, uh, uh, in, integrate certain kind of stylistic notions and concepts, right? And then we can generate something new. Yeah. Is it, it's not even a question of fairness, but I mean, legally, if the computer is doing something similar to that, right? It's actually, you know, reading all the text on the internet, watching or seeing all these great works of art and is able to generate something that is still distinct, right? Mm -hmm. Is that, where should the line be drawn there? Now, and of course, some, I mean, again, I'm not a lawyer either. There is a legal case pending, right, um, where Getty Images has specifically mm -hmm. sued Stability AI because uh, they um, did scrape, you know, their copyrighted uh, stock images database to the point where when you generate certain images on Stable Diffusion, you actually get a Getty watermark, <laughs> right, that is regenerated. Maybe, maybe giving it away a bit too much. Yeah, but. just a little, you know, cats out of the bag there. Um, so that'll be an interesting legal case to watch, but of course the courts take time as well. Sarah, did you have a comment on this about copyright? And Oh, not really. Um, I know that artists are upset about it because I think um, an artificial intelligence program just won an art competition. Um, uh, and the, there's a lot of um, unhappiness in that it created that art after having scraped um, modern artists and all that. Um, and so I think there's this, I, it did, that doesn't really go to copyright, but it goes to, um, you know, if, if ownership um, and uh, the feeling of um, uh, it being an unfair advantage that it can use all of it at once uh, to create new works. Yeah. All right. We have a question that's come in from our head of school. So I think we should answer it. <laughs> Some worry that ChatGPT contributes to the diminishing role of truth, facts, and analysis in public life. Is there any scenario in which ChatGPT ironically drives the pursuit of truth, facts, and analysis rather than diminishes them? So wow. Can it really be a force for good as opposed for misinformation? Well, it, it, I think that, I mean, I'll, I'll take a shot at this one. Um, one of the things that the kids have noticed when they use chat GPT is it's not always right. Um, and so you have to, and they know to do this, luckily, um, that you have to double check everything. So because it doesn't know the difference between truth and not truth, um, mm -hmm. it will generate things that sound really plausible. Um, but uh, but you have to go fact check it. So um, I do think that it will continue to um, help drive forward, you know, um, critical thinking and making sure you have your facts straight by verifying what it says. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. By having the fact check, you're thinking more about facts. That's yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you know, you don't just uh, it, the the for kids who are who are critical thinkers already and and have kind of gone through that process to build those skills they know that they need to they can't just rely on chat gpt it is not always accurate um it'll it'll create whole biographies for people who don't exist um sometimes it's a little glitchy on the analysis end though you know if you give it a large document and say you know what are the two uh, themes common in these documents that's mm -hmm. something that it it will do correctly so i think if you separate truth facts and analysis um truth and fact truth is built into the training data set the computer doesn't doesn't yet know truth uh but mm -hmm. um but on the analysis side i think chat gpt's got a bright future in the near future <laughs> well so, i mean should, should oh go ahead i mean what is one thing on that is that yeah. i think um you know humans without technology also have bias. Like we have cognitive biases in how we process information. I think there's one famous bias that I, I used to teach called the availability bias, which means we just grab knowledge that's available to us. Like if, if, we, if we know it, then it becomes first and foremost in our thinking. And the mere fact that these models are trained on the corpus of all knowledge, I mean, you know, 
we can actually rid ourselves of the availability bias because we have access to, you know, thousands and millions of human hours of, of work and just trying to find the facts of the world. And so I think it cuts both ways because it's not as though our cognition is totally unbiased either, but it's a, it's a fascinating question um, and yeah. one, worth, uh, one worth pondering. Yeah. Well, as is often the case in history, it's not about be training better systems or technology. It's about training better humans right? and how we adapt and how we as you not know, just individuals, as society. And if society, I mean, does push back and we do, we do from time to time saying, look, this is not how we want this to evolve. Right. We've seen some of the potential consequences. And so that can lead to regulation that can lead to, you know, uh, certain other kinds of controls that, that you know, and, and but it does rely on people to be up to date and informed, which is always the challenge. Right? Mm -hmm. So hopefully our SCH students are, are keeping up to date. <laughs> so I know we're almost out of time and, and Pete has reappeared to <laughs> confirm that. But I want to ask our panelists just really quick, maybe if you want to come up with sort of one little takeaway or one little thing that um, we can give to our audience if they want to learn more or follow up on on one item. Um, I will start, I would say that, uh, well, I mentioned that that series, everything is a remix, which is great. It's not entirely about AI, but the last thing, the last uh, episode was about AI. But then I would also commend, um, actually, you mentioned, I met your colleague in Wharton, Ethan Mollick, who has done an amazing amount of work in a very short amount of time. Uh, he's a great follow on, you know, maybe Twitter, although Twitter is a dumpster fire, but, you know, uh, on social media, because uh, he's really doing some, some awesome things in this space. Anyone else? I would say uh, Pete actually um, told me about this podcast, but Hard Fork with the New York Times podcast. It's a tech podcast and it has been doing a lot of um, programming on AI and it's been really helpful and interesting um, to, to listen to. So for people like me who are not quite as well informed as the rest of this panel about the actual ins and outs of AI, that's a great, a great way to learn more. Yeah, and, um... Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to uh, say, I don't know if they have a video released on it yet, but um, my favorite educational from a, you know, high level view YouTube channel is uh, three blue, one brown. Uh, they really pick apart math concepts. And I have, uh, if, if it's not out, I have no doubt that they, uh, they will be coming out with a chat GPT video. Yeah. Highly recommend that too. Mm -hmm. I'll just throw out just there, if you're interested in the philosophy, what is AI and what is knowledge, there was a great um, op ed written by actually Henry Kissinger and Eric Schmidt, former um, CEO oh. of Google in, in the Wall Street Journal. Um, I can't remember the name, but it basically goes back to the Enlightenment project was all about understanding things and creating knowledge. And now Chat GPT kind of disassociates knowledge and understanding. And I think there's a lot of really just great philosophy. And they, they wrote a beautiful op-ed that really challenges some of these questions. So I, I would highly recommend looking at it. Yeah. Uh, those are all great, great suggestions. So uh, I know we've come to the end of our time. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, this is, I mean, we could talk for hours on this stuff and we're just really scratching the surface, but um, thank you for your time and your insight. And uh, this has been really fun. So I'm sorry to our audience, we didn't get to all of your questions. We got to some of them. Um, but, uh, you know, if you want to engage further, I'm sure, well, one, I would, I, I'm always open to uh, chats and discussions. So feel free to reach out to me. But I bet Pete's going to also have something where you can uh, follow up with uh, him and the school as well. Back to you, Pete. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Young Moon. And thank you, everyone, for such a great panel. And I, I think you summarize it very well by saying we could talk for hours and we could listen for hours too. You're all very, very engaging to listen to. So thank you. And uh, yes, if you have questions, I would invite you to reach out to people at the school, uh, certainly myself, Pete at seh.org. But if you have a connection with anyone at the school too, uh, this is a topic that transcends technology for sure at this point. So it might be an advisor or a department, a uh, member of a department, it might be a division head. It certainly uh, could be engineering and robotics. It could be CEL. It could be me. It could be really any of us. But my inbox is always open and I could see the emails actually coming in <laughs> during the meeting. So Look forward to connecting more and talking more about this topic. And 
Paul, Amit, Young Mu, Sarah, thank you all very, very much for tonight. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks. You too. Thank you. Bye. It was nice seeing all of you.